All right, well, welcome back, everybody. My name's Andrew, and you're watching Kelly's Country Life. And today is a very exciting episode, and one that y'all have been asking about and looking forward to. We finally start the Tongue and Groove Pine Ceiling. All right, so if y'all watched the last episode, y'all seen that uh, I went ahead and poly-coated about half of our Tongue and Groove Pine. It just worked out good for me to do it that way because I have to set up so much of this stuff outside and spray it. I did not want to do any coating in the house if I could avoid it. Now, I apologize for the light very early in the morning and I need to get to work. We're going to start up here in the loft and uh, work our way out. And I'll go over some tips and tricks that's been told to me because keep in mind, this is my first time ever doing this. Luckily, I have some friends in the industry. I have one friend that's literally put up miles upon miles of this stuff. He does custom built horse barns and this stuff goes in a lot of the barns. So he's taught me through the process and gave me a lot of little tips and tricks. Now, as soon as the sun gets on out and it gets warmed up in the yard, a big part of this episode is we're gonna go poly coat the rest of that lumber. And I'm gonna explain a lot of the tips and tricks that he's given me along with another friend that's also a general contractor. So we're gonna have a lot going on in this episode. It's definitely gonna go over at least two parts before we'll have a full complete ceiling because we have to let this other uh, board that we're gonna do today dry overnight. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and say, I'm gonna do things inefficient. It's gonna drive y'all crazy in this video. I'm not cutting lumber in the house. I'm not gonna put a saw upstairs. So I'm gonna make a bunch of trips up and, up and down. I got a lift, it's gonna help me out. I'm not doing as much climbing today. So I'm probably gonna measure two to three runs at a time, go outside, cut it, carry it back in. Inefficient, I know, but I, the house is too far along. I've got too much going on to be throwing sawdust everywhere in here, all over the walls. We would never get this house clean again, not to mention, I don't want all that in my HVAC system as well. So one of the tools of choice today, y'all see I use this all the time, absolutely love it. It's the Bosch Blaze laser tape measure. These are pretty long runs. I don't wanna hold a tape measure up today. And sadly, the truss that y'all were hooked to, there's a couple of them in here. Well, they're bowed, just kind of the way it is. I guess they bowed whenever they either shipped them or welded them. So every single measurement I have to take, I can't just say, well, I know the distance between the two, everything's perfectly square, let's cut it and go. Not the case today. That's why I'm gonna to have to cut two to three pieces at once. I've already done verified this wall is perfectly square with the peak of the roof, nothing's out of whack. Otherwise, I think I would have to cut an odd piece, either top or bottom, to figure out where I want the inconsistency to be. Luckily, both sides are perfect. Down there to here, actually they're within one eighth of an inch. I can live with that. Your eye's not gonna see an odd piece here or there going off at a triangle trying to make up for the inconsistencies in the wall. Luckily, everything looks relatively square. All right, so I am using a 16 gauge brad nailer with two inch galvanized nails. And the reason I went with two inches is because I'm nailing three quarters of an inch material into three quarters of an inch material, also at a slight angle. So two inch should give me perfect penetration through both those pieces of wood, potentially some stick out on the back side, but because we're at an angle, possibly not. But I just wanted to make for sure I got all the way through both pieces of wood. Could have went with two and a half and been perfectly fine as well but I did not want to go any shorter than two inch. All right, so again, I am learning throughout this process. Your very first run, you are gonna to have to do some face nails. I can go back and fill those later, or um, potentially whatever trim that I do here, I, I can cover those up. And you'll notice I did not run this along the table saw and rip it at the perfect angle to the wall, because I know I'm gonna come back probably with some wood quarter round, or I may even rip some of these down and make me some specialized trim here to go around so i'm not worried about how this meets the wall i know i want to trim it out so face nail here the rest of the runs i will not face nail you'll hide the nail in the groove and i'm going to have to figure this out as you can see when this next piece slides on right here 
that nail just vanished. But then when you make a rookie mistake like I did right here and shot too low and slide this next piece on, look, you can see the nail. So I'm gonna have to be very careful about that. All right, so I'm taking like a scrap piece you just see me cut off the end of this and I'm gonna save it for what's called a beater block. You do not want to hit on any of the tongues of the next piece that you put in. So what I can do is take this old scrap piece of wood, slide it over the tongue to protect it, and then I can use my rubber mallet if I need to work a piece in, work a bow out, whatever that is that I need to use. But a beater block's important. That was stressed a lot to me for install. Do not hit your tongue, do not mess that up because that's what locks into your next piece. So now I'm at a point that I have to notch up for these boxes, so it's time to remove these lights. Need to make this cut from the back side so my jigsaw does not mar up my finish on the front. All right, well, I already had a dog off of work and come out here because as you can see, the sun is already out and blaring. I don't want it to get too terribly hot today and dry this too quickly. A lot of times that isn't a good thing. So I'm just gonna regurgitate some information that I've been told by people that do this for a living. Again, well, this is my second time poly coating. First time was yesterday, but I'm explaining what I'm using and why I'm doing it. A lot of this stuff makes sense. So for starters, I'm spraying outside as you can see. There is a lot of uh, controversy online of should you roll this stuff on, should you brush it on, should you spray it, should you do it inside, should you do it outside. But from what it's been told to me, you make a lot less mess, it's a lot quicker and a lot easier to use a airless paint sprayer. I've got a Graco Project Painter Plus and spray it on out here. I'd much rather make the mess outside than I would inside, especially being that the house is you know, mostly complete. Walls are sheetrock and painted, cabinets are in there. I just don't wanna make the mess. Plus, it is far easier to work out here than it is 16 foot in the air trying to roll or brush this stuff on. It would just drip everywhere. It would not be easy on the back, neck, everything else. So it makes sense to do this route. So I had a friend tell me that whenever you do stains or polyurethane to go with a smaller tip size on these guns right here. He uses a much more powerful Graco model, a big Magna model that'll run like three guns at a time. So I took his advice and bought an 11 series tip. They make a 311, which is six inch wide, 411, which is eight, all the way up to a five series, uh, which is like a 12 inch wide. But I found my Graco Project Painter Plus, which is the entry level model, just does not seem to be powerful enough. The tip kept plugging constantly on me, trying to run that smaller 11 size. So out of desperation yesterday, I put my big 515 tip in. This is what you're supposed to be running, thick exterior paint with a big swath, like a 12 inch swath. It's overkill, it's wasteful for this, but I just, 
I don't have the equipment apparently to push through a much smaller tip size. So always go with a smaller tip size if you're using stains or polyurethane. In my case, my painter just can't handle it. So you're gonna see this spray in a big wide swath. So my friend told me he highly recommends one coat on the backside and then two coats on the front. However, this is putting out such a thick coat, I'm only gonna do one on the front. Now there's a reason why. You're probably wondering why on earth would you polyurethane the backside? Well, it doesn't take much to do it. Literally a gallon and a half, maybe a gallon to do all this. And he claims that completely sealing the wood on all four sides keeps things nice and even. It keeps it from cupping as bad. It keeps it from drying out and splitting as bad. He highly recommends sealing it. Being that he has put in tens of thousands of board feet of this stuff in his lifetime and he does really high-end custom work i'm gonna go with that it doesn't take long now here's the beautiful part about painting the backside flip it over immediately you don't have to wait for it to dry i can paint all this in just a few minutes of the backside flip it over it doesn't matter that the saw horses and what it's propped up on is going to mar up the backside you're never going to see it you're just throwing a light seal coat on that now as far as the front goes, one thick coat, I'm doing no sanding in between, no extra coats or nothing, because again, I'm just trying to seal this. It's my understanding that if you don't poly this, um, again, that drying out, the cracking can occur. Plus, I constantly hear about when you handle this stuff, your natural oils out of your body, your fingerprints, everything else will show down the road if you don't poly this and seal everything in. They say that it just really shows stains bad. So that's another reason to, to poly and clear it. I'm sure y'all have a lot more reasons, but that's enough for me to do it. Now there is a, another big reason to do this outside and spraying it instead of after you put it up. And I think a lot of people miss this and this guy brought up a really valid point to me. So as you can see, this is the tongue. It kind of V's down. Imagine if this tongue were to slide into this groove inside, this is installed, and then you go to paint it. Well, what a lot of people don't realize is wood expands and wood also contracts. So if you go inside and poly, you'll see this turns a much darker color whenever you clear it. If you poly it inside and then this wood contracts, well, guess what? After a while, you start seeing clear unpolied grooves because well you rolled it on inside whereas outside if you spray it i'm going to hit that entire tongue right there and get it fully sealed so if there is ever any expansion and contraction the color is all even and the same i've never personally witnessed it but again this guy told me he has so whenever i'm spraying i'm focusing on that v right there to make sure i get this whole entire tongue covered now obviously i'll focus more on that whenever i flip this over now you're going to notice this uh looks like double v groove pine whereas when you flip it over it does not have this center groove me and my friend are trying to figure that out this company offers a single v groove which is your big flat side and what we like and double v groove so i'm wondering if they're cutting one board the same and can sell it as either or you can you pick a side I don't like this side with all the extra V's. It's too busy and starting to look like too much of a beadboard look. Kind of a fancy look. Doesn't really fit the style of our home. Now, another theory is they might be cutting this V in here to uh, not allow the boards to cup. That takes some of the tension out of the board. Because typically, if you do not have a V groove cut in there, you would come look you would come look at the way the grain is. Naturally, this board is going to want to cup back toward the way those rings are because there's some tension there with those rings but i think with them cutting this v that that eliminates that so typically if you're going to put this stuff up like say this piece right here and i didn't have the v uh, i think you would want to flip it this direction and then put it up on your roof is my understanding well just like yesterday mother nature showed up as soon as i get all this laid out the wind's picking up so i'm gonna have to fight with trash and debris blowing around luckily i've already done put some up this morning and the grass and stuff came out of it real easy the little bit that blew on it yesterday but the majority of it looks fine and clear i guess i can always sand down any bad spots clear it again plus i also bought a lot of extra lumber in case there's splits like i'm seeing right here in sections that i just can't cut out or use so i'm gonna get to spraying i forgot to mention i'm using a satin uh, polyurethane personally i don't like semi-gloss or gloss on wood i i just do not think that looks good with that high gloss finish inside i want kind of a dull just sealer coat and i love the color that this turns it more than anything
just like that, we are finished. And I tell you what, today went so much smoother than yesterday. I, the 515 tip, I know it's the absolute wrong tip for this, but it's putting down such a nice, thick, even coat. I'm not seeing dry spots. I love how thick it is. I'm gonna stick with that tip for the future. It's good for painting the house and it's working really good for this. Yes, it's being wasteful and it is throwing too wide of a fan, but if you stack your lumber tight like this, that wide fan is just putting, you basically you're double coating everything. I think oh, I, that's why it's got such a nice, beautiful thick coat on there. Man, I love the coloration that comes out of this wood whenever you poly it. Just look at that. Look at that green. Looks beautiful. Darkened it up a little, which I really, really like. Now it's protected, won't show fingerprints, everything else. So nothing to do now, but uh, let this dry for several hours and then we'll stack it up and install it tomorrow. Let's head back to the house, start installing some more that was uh, prepared yesterday. to show this off without the lights on and those are gonna blind you it's just too dark in the house right now but look at this we now have the loft done as far as all the main boards and it looks so good I really love the red tones in the wood it ties in the kitchen cabinets downstairs great now I'm still making my mind up how I want to close this in here. I've already got a couple of ideas. We still have to work trim all the way around, but that's going to be the final thing that I do. So next episode, we're just going to focus on knocking out the rest of this ceiling. And as you can see, I have all the lumber inside now. It's poly coated and we're done with that. So what do you think about this? I think it is gorgeous. It looks so good. I am so excited to see what the rest of the house is going to look like when it's all done in this beautiful tongue and groove pine right here. Hopefully y'all enjoyed the episode. Next one, we'll go over a few more tips and tricks as we move out over into the main room and kind of figure this out together. Thanks for watching.